So welcome everybody to our next installment of the Soul Health webinar series. My name is Stephanie Carhoff. I'm a field specialist with Ohio State Extension. So today's topic is intercropping and soil health. Just a few housekeeping items today. We are going to offer one CTA credit, and that will be shown at the end of the program. There'll be a QR code that you can scan with the CTA app or instructions to add that credit if you do not have a smart device. This session is being recorded, and it'll be available at the agcrops.osu.edu website and the Ohio State Agronomy YouTube channel. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll reserve the Q&A for questions for our speaker and then the chat for more informal conversation if needed. If you have any questions, you can email Jamie Hampton at hampton.297 at osu.edu. So our speaker today is Lucas Criswell. He's joining us from Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, where he farms with his father. And they've had great success in adopting cover crops and no-till practices. And he's going to share today some of their experiences with intercropping and relay cropping in their system. So, so I'm Lucas Criswell. I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, and I asked to speak today about uh, <laughs> what we've been doing to relay cropping and um, something that I kind of picked up on here from a friend of mine from Wisconsin by the name of John Coots and another friend in Iowa, uh, Lauren Steinloggy. They've been uh, working with this process and um, of course I've been working with uh, planting green and cover crops for probably close to 20 years. And um, in our area of Pennsylvania, we have a uh, short growing season for doing double cropping behind wheat. So it intrigued me to see what uh, we could do uh, to maximize maybe some double cropping benefits and uh, to actually, um, let's go and get this to the whole thing. So it looks a little bit better. Um, you can go to the, the bottom of your screen on that bottom right where it shows the full presenter view. If you want to click that, that will bring up the full slide. Yeah, uh, go to the my right. Should be your right to you. One more. There, we go. there you go. So we used to work with all these cover crops and that I, I was intrigued by allowing our, our um, small grain to grow as much as possible and we roll it down and we're planting green into it. And I want to know, figure out how we could maximize our, how to maximize our, our grain production and also be able to do some double cropping. Um, so we started to uh, figure out a uh, process how to do that. Um, one of the first challenges is we have to plant a, uh, the wheat in such a way that you're able to harvest it. And um, for my first year, we just did 30 inch wheat and followed along with, um, um, here's me planting 30 inch wheat for the first year with a corn planter since that's what we had. And uh, it, it, it looked nice, it turned out good. Um, the next uh, step was to figure out how we're going to get the soybeans planted between the, between the wheat. The biggest thing is with relay cropping is you want to find the proper equipment that's matched up. It's, it's hard to use different width equipment to be able to follow your, um, your planting passes of your wheat before. So we uh, got a hold of a 12 row stack fold planter to put on the one tractor to be able to follow our uh, wheat rows because we have a 12 row planter we plant the wheat with. And um, it's all about maximizing your equipment to fit your, uh, the process of the whole relay planting. Um, 
it um it went very well the first year working on this and uh i have some couple pictures later here then we can look at but um a lot of discussion on how thick we plant our wheat um at first i thought we needed it thinner with the single row wheat this year it yielded about 40 bushel of the acre which i was kind of blown away by by its yield and um but you need your equipment to be able to fit in between the rows to maximize getting the soybeans placed properly in between the rows to maximize the sunlight and that for it to be able to grow um and what's nice is when you have the equipment properly sized the the goal is to maximize not running over your wheat crop as much as possible but it's, it's amazing how resilient the wheat is able to run over it and still um, um be able to uh have the yield out of it but so we had to move some of the attachments around on the corn planter traditionally on this corn planter that wheel would have been between the rows and we had to move the the transport wheel into the center of the row um just to be able to follow all your wheat rows it takes a little bit of a hard mindset to think about this process because uh, you uh, it's just not your traditional planting corn. Um, we have the tractor set up on 90 inch centers. So we're straddling, uh, you can see my cursor on there. You gotta straddle three rows of the wheat to be able to then have the planter offset plant between the wheat rows. We're traditionally planting corn. You have your tires are running between your rows of corn. And here we're actually wanting to run a tractor where the seed's going to be planted. So it, it takes a little bit to get that it wrapped up in your head that you got to change your process around to plant between the rows of wheat. Um, our second year doing this, a uh, buddy of mine out in Wisconsin is doing a lot of this. He uh, was using a row crop head and uh, to be able to harvest those uh, wheat rows out of the soybeans a lot nicer and cleaner and uh so we were able to pick up a row crop head we modified it a little bit that's around here with it but it made uh harvesting the soybeans harvesting the wheat a lot cleaner and pulling those wheat rows out of those soybeans um so my herbicide looking at some things here the herbicide we're using is just traditional harmony um on top of our wheat crop, just like it was gonna be a full season wheat crop. Um, and uh, my goal is to definitely get some 2,4-D out there when we're putting the harmony out there, just kind of help with our mare's tail. And it, it's crazy how clean the fields stay uh, with just a little bit of harmony and 2,4-D. Once you start growing companion crops, relay crops together like this, you're you're taking on uh, planting it you're, you're almost planting a weed between the rows and it really as long as the 24d is a must for me with our mayor's sale that we have just to keep uh keep that at bay and uh not till we harvest the beans that we make and harvest the wheat and we make another application once the wheat is off but um uh, it's a pretty, uh, this is my second, third year, second, third year, I think, and um, doing this, this picture here. And uh, these beans are pretty healthy and pretty successful in, in that process of uh, thinking that we finally starting to get somewhere with it. This was probably about a week, week later. Um, it's amazing how the beans are able to uh, canopy back out and take over uh, the space where the wheat was. Of course, you have breakdowns. We had some modifications we had to do. That, that's the fun of this uh, whole process is um, finding uh, the weak spots in it. Something that I learned uh, from John Coots in Wisconsin is I was wanting to plant a shorter season. So my traditional soybean maturity in our area is probably a low group three. 
And what I learned very quickly is that when you're putting this soybean in the stress like this, that it is, it, it kind of goes into a shutdown mode. And once you harvest the wheat, it kind of comes back to life. And if you have too short of a season in there, it, it's going to skip, it's going to skip a couple of days in there. And it just didn't produce enough nodules. So we've gone to a, a late three, nine to a four O now. And uh, that's really uh, helped our soybean yield if it rains. Um, this, uh, the same thing with the wheat. Um, we still keep the wheat uh, population up there. We're still probably dropping about 1 million seeds per acre. Um, and the wheat is pretty phenomenal in its ability to tiller and still maximize yield. I think this is my twin row. Uh, when we were starting to go to twin row and our yields jumped significantly once we jumped to twin row. But uh, you can see out here with my six row head, we were running over some beans out here in my contours and uh, which I was striving to get to the next level of a 12 row head to maximize uh, not running over our beans as much. And we've finally got to that here this past summer. This was, uh, so here's a talk about herbicide. This is my check, check plot. Not really, we ran, out of, we ran out of wheat here in this field. So I just planted the beans the entire way across the field use the same herbicide pass across the wheat, but you can see what that wheat does to keep just the weeds shaded out. I thought this was pretty, pretty unique slide here. Um, and as you can see off the left, I'm just getting ready to make a, uh, the second, the first post application after harvest. So we'll be cleaning these, all these weeds up, but it just goes to show how much pressure the beans will, uh, the wheat will take out of the beans. Um, soybean population, we are planting pretty much the same soybean population as we would be in a traditional soybean crop. Um, we're still about 140,000, 150 is my goal. Um, that year we harvested 55 bushel beans and um, I think it was like 50 bushel wheat and that was with a single row of wheat there yet. Um, the next couple of slides, a friend of mine in Iowa, um, he's using a uh, mounted toolbar to uh, go back in and intercede the uh, soybeans into his rye. And uh, he's also has harvested some at the same time. But uh, what we're finding though, is that the, the ability of these twin row crops is the ability to either take out your cover crop or harvest the, the small grains off. And um, we uh, noticed the ability to get a better stand of having the twin row there versus the, the solid seeded cover crop, just the ability to get a better stand there and better seed to soil contact. Um, he actually planted um, buckwheat in with his um, soybeans also and harvested two, three crops at once where he harvested his rye off and his soybeans and his buckwheat in the fall with three crops. I got some other pictures here off a different slide that I wanna try and pull up. Anybody has any questions right now? I could take them while I'm looking at some things. We do have one question in the Q&A so far, Lucas, and that's from Dan Davidson. And he wants to know how important is rainfall to the soybean after that wheat harvest? Very, very important. So 
course, here in Pennsylvania, not far off from Ohio, or like a 40 inch rainfall. And um, this past year, um, I probably felt I hit a home run. We were harvesting some 80 bushel wheat. The beans looked superb underneath the wheat crop, but it just did not give us an inch. They, I feel we need a half an inch to an inch to get that soybean crop going again. And we just did not get that. And um, it was very hard to um, get those beans going again. We never got over an inch of rain all summer and we would get a couple tenths, a couple tenths. And uh, that is the trick that we haven't been able to master yet is how to figure out when it's gonna rain or not. Um, Lucas, I have a question. Why didn't you just use yep. your grain table to uh, and maybe grow a taller wheat to harvest your wheat instead of uh, trying to uh, use a row crop head? So I like to, you want to, sometimes the beans are as tall as the wheat, as you can see in those pictures. So you need to be able to push the, the, the wheat down and um, Got a picture up here. I'll show you where I am using my. Uh... There we go. Um, this past year, we picked up a bigger combine now, and you still need a blocker to push your beans down when they get too high. You want to be able to harvest that wheat stem down as far as possible to maximize your sunlight. Um, it. Uh, and like was just asked before about moisture. Um, you want to maximize, I was just talking with a friend of mine yesterday about planting solid wheat with the drill and then coming back through or a broadcast, coming back through and spraying out a band of uh, your small grains out and then doing relay planting that way. And I did that once and we struggled with the amount of tillers on the outer edge of that crown who um, they weren't ripe they weren't mature they were lower and when we plant things in a true twin row aspect and able to cut that wheat as low as possible it just allows those soybeans to expand uh, really quick um, so that's that's what's been unique about that row crop. When I used it on my smaller combine, I really liked how it, it just, it pulled that pulled that, that wheat right out of those rows of beans. Um, but since we've gone a bigger combine, trying to maximize uh, the equipment I have, and, and uh, we made some blockers for my 30 foot grain platform to uh, follow my 30 foot planter passes. And, this did okay. I'm still not happy with it. Um, we make some different blockers this coming year is what we might do with this grain table. Um, so it, um, I guess it is. This is our twin row wheat here. And as you can see down here in the bottom is with the grain head, you get some stragglers now and then because it doesn't guide the wheat right into the row to cut it off real nice. You still get some tillering or some wheat down here that some, row, some wheat heads don't get cut off right. So you really got to, when you're doing a twin row, it's still tillers, it still has some short heads and you still need to get down as far as you can to cut those tillering off so that that's the importance of needing to cut low cutting the tops off of the wheat uh, it's just it's just not enough once we get in this situation um these are my beans from this year um we harvested that wheat the beans just looked phenomenal and but as the other person asked about rainfall we still need what I've learned, we still need a good half an inch to an inch to get these suckers going again. And um, it's amazing how resilient the soybeans are between the rows. Um, they look super healthy. 
the longer season has really helped that of the soybean just to they're, they're going to be around a lot longer so they're not setting nodes yet and until it seems like once you cut the weed off and get some sunlight into them then they really uh really seem to uh, uh come out a lot better We uh, went to this Lexian combine and we're, we're fortunate enough to uh, find a uh, set of tracks and a spacer plate from John Cooch from Wisconsin. Um, it's all about making your equipment match um, match what you want to do. You, you want to avoid running that soybean over as much as possible. <laughs> This picture is taking on probably one of the steepest hills that I farm. And uh, we're straddling five, uh, five rows of wheat here. And I'm pretty tickled with uh, this track combine, how we're able to uh, make the most use for our ground for some of this relay cropping. Um, and we also uh, switched our, uh, planting tractor to a track tractor. We don't farm anything flat around here. Things might be a little flatter out in Ohio, but um, I was able to pick up this track tractor on narrow tracks. And here again, we're, we're straddling 90 inches of rows. Yeah, 90 inches. Yeah, three rows of wheat, 90 inches. and allows the planter to uh, track in there really nicely. Um, of course, you have to skip every other every other you have to count different rows when you're counting back and forth it's a lot of math in your head so um when you're planting the beans into the wheat but as you can see with the track tractor it really on the side hill it really uh keeps the planter centered over top of the the gap that you need to be and um i know everybody says i'm, I'm not here preaching that everybody has to do this um this is just what we're doing on our farm and we're, we're still pursuing it. We got close to 250 acres out this year. Um, praying for rain this year. Um, it, Bring up some other pictures here that I didn't update in that slide. Lucas, while you're getting those pictures loaded up, we did have another question in the Q and A, and that is, what is your fertilization program, and how do you top dress your wheat? So our fertilizer, our fertilizer program, pretty much the same as um, traditional wheat. Um, the past couple of years, I think I, I've made a, a dry fertilizer pass. We're, we're still fertilizing for 100 bushel wheat. Um, one year I tried to turn my stream bars uh, sideways and just uh, dribble the nitrogen right over top of the wheat row. Um, that was fine when the wind wasn't blowing. And um, but I could tell where the nitrogen did hit right over top of the row properly. So we went right back to making broadcast nitrogen applications. Um, and it's, and that's, what's pretty nice about the, the twin row, all your application equipment follows in the same rows as your planter passes. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's, I love, I love growing this crop. Your it's kind of like corn. Um, you're in row crops, and uh, we're making an early pass nitrogen and a second pass, and applying a fungicide. Yet, the unfortunate part is um, you do got to run some soybeans over when you're making a fungicide application. Um, and um, it's phenomenal looking at this wheat that this stuff will still yield a hundred bushel. Uh, numerous times we've had 90 to 100 bushel wheat in spots and you end up with about 85 bushel average so it's important to keep the tillering up um 
with the thick stands and um it was, it's been amazing watching this process how that wheat's been able to adapt without having that with having that big space between it um the problem is depending on the growth of the wheat and the year we're having is we have um made an application of oh i just lost it i want to say palisade uh the growth regulator um is that right i think it's palisade the growth regulator to keep the wheat from getting too rank and falling flat and the question was about the row crop head and that's where the row crop head really comes in handy is if you get a flat wheat crop that row crop head will stand that wheat back up and uh gives us a little bit better ability to get that wheat out of that bean row um So one of the one of my rabbit holes, what has me interested in this relay cropping is the whole discussion on um, carbon. Um, something I've realized about our uh, our um, soils and discussion about soil health and is how we need to get our carbon built up in our soils as much as possible and. So what has drawn me to our, our big cover crops is drawn me to this relay cropping. And because I don't know if anybody's noticed, we start growing these monocrops of soybeans. Soybeans are a huge consumer of uh, carbon. And when uh, we've grown, I've grown our soybeans in a back-to-back -back legume crop. Um, we pulled too much carbon out of our systems and I've watched our soil test in not just not nutrients but more in just our, our color of our soils and you can see it in the soil erosion that we've we start to collapse our systems really fast with these solid legume stands and what it has me really interested is trying to perfect this relay cropping to have a grass growing with this small grain. Yeah, the grass, yeah. Grass growing with these soybeans to continue to build your carbon as well as able to get a almost close to normal soybean crop. And uh, I will say my erosion is next to nothing in these relay fields come fall just because of having that residue still laying in the field there. Um, you can see the hills that I'm working on. That, that is, erosion is one of my, my biggest fears. We've been no-till for 30 plus years. And um, this, this has been a, an eye-opener on what it's done to our soil quality, um, along with planting into large covers. I just feel that if we can maximize perfect this process here, which it's not for everybody because you need to have the right equipment to match it up. And I recommend the guys do not go out and buy expensive equipment to try and make this work. You wanna use what you got and uh, prove it to yourself first. And that's what I've done the last three, four years. And uh, with buying the, the larger combine and the narrow tracks, um, I really feel we're set to, uh, keep taking this to the next level and, and perfecting this uh, this process. But so allows me having the proper equipment matched up to our planning equipment, take, allows me to take this on to some other farms and the contours and the hillsides that were weren't as conducive to uh, the smaller equipment that I had now. And we're practically not running over any soybean rows at harvest now, even on my steepest hills, as you saw. Um, but I stick with, uh, right now I try and run an enlist bean into my relay fields. That way we can clean up any broad leaves, mare's tail that now I, I know Palmer is not far away. It's in our County. I'm not looking forward to it, but 
Um, so I'm kind of leaving, I grow some plenish soybeans in my traditional soybeans. So I want to put a list in my relay fields just to have that uh, post application of cleaning up the, the fields. Um, I was going down a, another path with that. I forget where I was going with it, but <clears throat> any other discussions? Questions? Well, I think it's, it's a fun. question that came up. You talked about not getting extra equipment, but without running over the beans, have you thought about getting a drone to apply your fungicide on your wheat? Sure. That'd be great. Um, all right. So I, I use a big drone sometimes, a helicopter. Um, the helicopter was lined up last year. They broke down. Um, and I ended up, it needed done. And I just dove back into it. So Two years ago, I used a helicopter, tried to get a helicopter lined up this year. And um, nobody in our area is doing drone applications yet. Um, but yes, that would be a great, great option um, for sure. Another question came up. Uh, how do you manage your straw during your weed harvest? Good question. So it's amazing when you get in those thick hundred bushel spots, it creates a lot of straw. And you want to have your chopper set right. And um, and that's one disadvantage of cutting low is you're running a lot of straw through there, but I want the sunlight getting back into those beans. But you just spread the straw back over the beans and try and set things proper enough to get it spread out. And those beans will pop through that straw before you know it. Um, it doesn't take much. Of course, my other Achilles heel is we're cutting this wheat pretty, pretty wet. We are drying it. So of course the straw is tougher also. And um, it's, um, it is an issue that you definitely wanna keep an eye on it, but I've never had an issue with the straw suffocating the beans yet i mean if you stop and lay a big wad out there yeah you're gonna have an issue so when we stop i gotta stop in the field i try and back up probably 15 feet or so just to spread that wad that comes out of the combine at that field stop another question is uh what's your uh soybean planting population and do you treat or do you treat your soybean seed Good question. Great question. We're still about 140, 50,000. We're planting these relay beans. Um, it, uh, we are, I am treating these beans because I'm planting these early. Um, actually, but the rest of my beans, I actually plant naked. Um, we, uh, um, I should just get rid of insecticide on this first pass also. I have my own personal opinions why we plant untreated beans, but um, a lot of work that John Tooker has done here in Penn State with the links to our slugs. We have a pretty severe slug issue in Pennsylvania. And uh, one of the reasons why I pulled our treatment off all our other soybeans and have had success with it just a little concern, these relay beans were going out early, uh, mid-April to get them planted. So I just kind of kept it on there to help protect against anything, but I think I could pull it off. Um, this picture here just shows uh, what happens when you have a gap, uh, nothing planted in the field. And um, it's still a harmony application across that whole uh, wheat crop. And uh, it's amazing just having the soybeans in between the wheat row. There's been a lot of discussion about I me. Mean, it just, once there's something else growing there, it, it, the soil knows not to grow anything else. Of course, there's still some weeds growing around the beans, but um, this is this year. You can see the beans yellowed up. The question about rainfall, you can see these bean leaves are really yellowed up. These beans are stressed, um, but I feel that it's, this was 
if we would have gotten an inch of rain on these beans, these things would have just come back to life, and we just did not get it. And um, so I'm not I'm not writing it off yet, but there is that risk. <clears throat> Any other questions come up? Yeah, back to the uh, populations. Uh, you talked yep. about wheat population a bit, but have you done any experimenting with different planting populations? Yeah, so the one year we were we still stayed up in the million two, million three, and uh, which is kind of where we typically drill our wheat, and we had a bunch of lodging, so I I dropped it back to about eight hundred thousand seeds the one year. And I feel we just didn't maximize the yield. Um, so this fall, we went back to around 1-1. One, one. And um, this twin row wheat is just, it's crazy what it can do. Um, we still fertilize it like traditional wheat. Um, and it's, I taught, I, at times I, this year i only saw 80 85 bushel average on farms which is still phenomenal and i'm like well i'm sure the neighbors are all getting 100 and i talked to all my neighbors and they were they were all getting 60 80 bushel also so i know we gotta keep the wheat stands up there to maximize the yield but it's not all about maximizing yield also i know but um our first crop off is, is going to be our best return on investment and any soybeans we can get off of it is just going to be a bonus. Um, hands down, um, in our area, I mean, if we get a 50 bushel soybean crop is our average yield for our area. If I can pull off 40 bushel, um, I'd be tickled. And um, we've done that two years, and the other years we've had flops because of no rain um but if i'm still pulling 80 to 90 bushel of wheat off i still count that as a win because we've still pulled a full season crop off so um the wheat stand um you still want to still keep your population up there um when i did the single row wheat the first year we averaged 35 bushel wheat the beans, I think, probably did the best because they had the most sunlight. Um, but uh, I'm more interested in getting a little thicker stand of wheat, and I could rather live with a little less soybean. So, kind um, of depends what your ultimate goal is. Um, maximize profit off of which crop. Um, Again, I have a friend down in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. If anybody's interested in his contact, he has set up his drill, 30 foot drill to make. Um, he has, I think it's 30 inches width of wheat. He has, and he has blocked off for his combine tires. I think it's a 30 inch uh, wide band of wheat where that would be four four, seven and a half inch uh, rows of wheat together. And then he plants a double row of soybeans between that 30 inch wheat, 30 inch patch of wheat. But he can come through this combine with the wide tires and still harvest his wheat off. He has pushers on his grain head that he pushes down to soybeans and still try and cut the small grain as low as possible. And, uh, so it, it's about utilizing the equipment you have to experiment with some of this stuff. I do not recommend anybody just to go out and spend a lot of money. Another question came in about uh, fertilization uh, with two different crops. Uh, do you, how do you fertilize uh, other than you mentioned top dressing the wheat for a hundred bushel? Uh, do you, do you do your other fertilization program just standard? Yeah, so I'm I'm in a we spread a lot of manure. We're on my corn crop. We import hog and chick manure. So most times my my soybeans and small grains are scavengers for what the corn is left behind since 
most of the times when we're applying doors on, uh, on uh, our corn crop, there's usually excess potash and phosphorus that we typically don't need to fertilize as much with our soybean or our small grain crops. So that's why I focus solely on on uh, just the nitrogen application on our small grain. But I've had concern. I know if you apply too much nitrogen to soybeans, they can make them lazy. And I have that concern with our nitrogen application on, on our wheat. So it's just a concern. I haven't able to uh, nail that down if that's detrimental or not to our soybean crop, but it's it's something that I, I think about at times. Hey, we had another question about, uh, do you look for certain types of wheat, tall or short, uh, wide or narrow flag leaf or anything else? The cheapest. <laughs> no, I, I, I do not, I do not. Um, high yielding wheat, um, um, I do, we do have a, a fair amount of issues with head scab up here. I know there's some head scab resistant varieties that are out there. I, just, I, I probably do look for that. Um, but no, I, I don't, I don't try and focus on one wheat versus another. I do not. The biggest thing is just back to the soybeans. You want a longer season soybean because when you harvest that small grain off, that it um, the beans got a lot of life left in them, a lot of life cycle in them to go through their their process that they need to. Another question that came in, uh, after you harvest the wheat and then the soybeans, do you plant a cover crop? If so, what? And uh, then what follows in your rotation? So yes, uh, yep, absolutely. Um, so these beans, since they're group fours, they are the last beans that I harvest. And um, so they are the last fields to get cover crop. Um, since we had a drought this year, we had a lot of open ground with the beans being so short. I actually went out and we broadcast uh, a bunch of rye onto my relay fields. And we did not have a very good success with that. I was very disappointed. Um, and again, I talked about slugs in our area. Um, with this relay fields, it makes such an awesome thatch of uh, residue from the wheat there that it harbors the slugs also. And as soon as the rye, we got some rain in September finally, and I was like, this is gonna be perfect. And I just, we did, we, I had almost a complete failure of the broadcast rye onto the relay beans. I was very disappointed. And I'm supposed to be this expert and be able to do everything. And I, I just can't, I'm very disappointed. I haven't been able to get that thing to work right. and. I know it's because of our slug pressure. Um, I've watched it numerous years that um, we got a lot better success getting our seed into the ground, cover crop into the ground. And uh, um, getting it to grow a little bit quicker and the slugs don't have the ability to chew off the sprouts and that. I mean, they, those dumb things just are attracted to anything that's young and growing and high in protein. And, um, but yes, yeah, so all, all fields get cover crop once harvested of what type, uh, we, we plant rye, um, vetch and winter pea. Um, I know it's against the norm. I actually, I plant vetch and winter pea right in the beginning of November. And of course this year we've all been very warm. Uh, looks like the vetch is gonna be fine. Of course, it's really small. Everything is really small because of the late planting, but um, we've been harvesting and, and keeping. I have a rye pea vetch that I grow together and harvest 
and clean it and just reseed it. And I've been using my own seed for the last three, four years now. And I don't know if my vetch is adapted to our environment, but um, I have no problem getting winter pea and vetch to to be uh, to make it through the winter here. Um, that's the mix I have, so I keep using it. So, of course, I'm not paying a high dollar price for it. I might change my attitude if I was having to buy all that vetch and peas, but um, it's been it's been unique to keep planting those mixes late into November. It's still getting them established. So um, it frees me up to keep pushing that cover crop envelope late into the season. That's all the questions that we have uh, in the uh, box, but I was wondering, uh, have you noticed any other soil health benefits to this relay cropping system besides the carbon aspect? The carbon is a big thing and erosion has just been big. So I think that's our water infiltration is, I mean, Water infiltration and high carbon go hand in hand. Um, and just creating that armor. Um, that The armor is what I think led me down the path of uh, planting green in the big covers. When Gabe Brown talked about armor and Ray Archuleta. And, and so to figure out how to maximize that armor on our soils. And when you have armor, you create habitat. When you have habitat for the ground beetles to eat the slugs. But we also create a lot of armor for the slugs to hide in at the same time. Um, but um, in, our, in, our, in our area, um, the armor is huge um, just for... Um, for creating that habitat and the carbon and the water infiltration. So um, it kind of creates a lid over top of your soil and gives your earthworms a, creates a little roof for your earthworms to do their work right on top of the surface. And um, it's, it's, that's one of the other unique, and it, the relay fields kind of look like my big cover crop fields is it, it has just a thick thatch underneath my, on the top of your soil this time of year. It's been huge with, uh, I, I think some of our soybean harvests have been getting later and later, even our regular soybeans. And I'm not getting the soybeans established as early, yeah, the cover crop established as early as I have in the past. And it's comforting knowing we have a nice residue there, even though it's not green, we still have some good residue there to uh, protect from those heavy rainfalls and such. Another question came in, how much revenue per acre do you make off of the relay crop compared to corn alone? Oh, I thought I had that in here. I don't have those numbers in front of me right now, but um, wheat alone, um, and the relay beans, the wheat alone is very competitive with the corn to an extent. Um, when you add the relay to it, the soybeans to it is when we can take it over top of the, the corn revenue um, when we can harvest beans. Um, this past year, of course, we were dry everywhere. I wish I would have had wheat on every acre and still had a failed soybean crop in between it because um, our wheat still did exceptionally well at 80, 85 bushel uh, versus our 100 bushel wheat, uh, 100 bushel corn crop this year. Um, but uh, corn is still king. It's still hard to plant. As you can, most of my most of my wheat relay is planted in a corn stubble because that is where I would plant soybeans. And everybody challenges me, well, 
what I, I like to do that. I, and I know weed in the corn isn't the best because of your um, disease issues, but I'm not focusing on beans. I'm not focusing on weed. I'm trying to focus on the practice of getting a grass growing with the soybean. So um, we're just trying to maximize the rotation. So typically uh, we'll go back to corn. It'll be corn, then relay crop, of corn and beans and then traditionally we'll go back to corn again the following year so that was the question about rotation another question came in uh, can you ensure both relay crops yes it's kind of insured as a double crop actually um, my crop insurance guy just said there's some new stuff that just came out here this this year um, for relay cropping a little bit differently to to uh, um, better better uh, determine what's what a little more clear roles and laws. So yes, it is it is doable. But I kind of look at the one year actually I, I don't really ensure the wheat crop but i do ensure the bean crop and that's how to put it in a double crop but um the wheat's kind of the insurance for the bean crop because if you can still harvest 80 90 bushel wheat that's that's a that's a win and um it's kind of self-insured at times i feel Another question, uh, do you use spring wheat instead of winter wheat if you are following corn? No, uh, spring wheat in our area would not, would not go well. Um, it's, we're not cold enough. Um, and I, we, I just still, I pushed my wheat planting late and it's fine. Um, it'll catch up in the spring. Um, so good question. It just made me think about, it. I do, I do kind of plan a little shorter season corn planned where I want to do my relay planting, um, to get that corn off earlier. So we do, my goal is to get our, our wheat planted, the relay wheat planted in October, but it doesn't always happen. But, uh, that is my ultimate goal. I plant my twin row wheat with a Kinsey planter that we narrow up the front 15 inch pushers and uh, we can get uh, about an eight, eight inch twin row is what we're doing. Again, I'm utilizing a piece of equipment that I already have. So that's been very beneficial for that aspect. Okay, does anybody else have any other questions that they'd like to ask Lucas? Doesn't appear we have any other questions uh, in our question and answer box, Lucas. So appreciate your uh, answering all the questions that we did have. No problem. Questions are the best part of the presentation I always feel. Sure. 